fantastic. Um, there is a newsletter for MOFAD and for Gastro Obscura. I really recommend signing up for both. That's how you find out about our weekly programs. This is a series that'll be continuing throughout the summer. So you wanna make sure that you know what's going on with both of us. Um, both of our organizations and also just want to let you know we are going to be recording this, which is also why we ask that you keep your video cameras on because we want to make sure we're just kind of focused on the speakers tonight. It's just for archival purposes, not for anything else, but um, just as a courtesy, we wanted to let you know and also ask that your video cameras stay off, your microphones stay off, and at the end of this, we will have time for Q&A. Um, so again, thank you so much. It is a really difficult time in the United States right now. Um, I just want to acknowledge that. And again, thank you for being together. It means a lot. So I want to pass it qu over quickly to my colleague, Luke at Gastro Obscura, who's just going to tell you quickly about Gastro Obscura. Thank you. Luke, you're muted. Apologies. <laughs> uh, my name is Luke Bader. I'm the Gastro Obscura moderator today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you all. The, this online experience is part of Gastro Obscura, whose mission is to inspire wonder and curiosity about the world through food and drink. Gastro Obscura's articles, videos, and guides explore what food and drink reveal about the places where they've made and the people who make them. In partnership with chefs, historians, and other experts, Gastro Obscura helps travelers and curious people experience culinary wonders firsthand. And check our parent site, aliceobscura.com, for more inspiring stories, incredible online experiences, and live streams with the Alice Obscura community all part of our Wonder From Home initiative. So I'm gonna send it back to Theron. Awesome, thank you so much, Luke. Okay, tonight we have such incredible guests um, who I am so happy and honored to also call friends. Um, Rich Shi, he's been a friend of MOFAD for, I don't know, I think since the beginning. Um, he is, he's one of the leading culinary explorers of Koji and Miso in the United States. And he's an in-demand food preservation consultant. And he's the exhibit engineer for, for MOFAD. So like I said, he's been part of our community for a really long time. We're so grateful to be with him tonight. He has a blog called rcookquest.com. I will definitely send you this information in a follow-up email tomorrow. And of course, Jeremy Umansky, such a dear friend from my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. So happy he can be with us tonight. He's the chef owner of Larder, a curated delicatessen and bakery in Cleveland, um, a James Beer nominated restaurant, um, one of the most innovative and exciting restaurants in the United States. He's been featured in numerous publications like Bon Appetit and Sever, and was named the Deli Prophet by Food and Wine. Um, I'm so happy to have them here and to turn it over. So again, like I said, there's going to be a Q&A at the end. So please hold your questions and make sure uh, you have them written down so you can chat them to us at the end. Jeremy, Rich, take it away. Hi. I want to make sure Rich is unmuted. Hey there. There we go. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome. We're uh, so excited to have you. Yeah, we're super stoked to have you. Um, and Rich and I are going to kind of, uh, you know, go back and forth uh, about some of the things involving Koji. Um, you know, we always find it best to more or less kind of start at the beginning. Um, you know, this, uh, it's where we started. It's where a lot of you are starting, um, you know, and then we'll kind of get into some of the, the ins and outs of it. We're going to show you how you can easily use Koji and Koji mm -hmm. meat at, at your house. Um, and then we'll have some questions. So if there's anything that we didn't touch on, uh, you'll be able to, uh, to pick our brains. So uh, one thing we always like to point out too is, um, and thanks to, to Gastro Obscura and MoFad for hosting us, like they create such amazing community and all of you do too, especially around Koji. Uh, so it doesn't end here. Feel free to reach out to Rich or I or anybody else using the, the hashtag Koji Builds community um that's we learned off of you know back and forth with a lot of people that's how how rich and i met uh and we encourage you to do the same so uh, there's so many people out there doing so many amazing things with it yeah it's pretty awesome to be here and um be speaking to you today about koji i mean i think one of the most amazing things that um we often talk about in terms of koji is that um pretty much all of you have you know had something with koji in it um, and it's, it's commonplace in your, in your kitchen right now. Um, and that's soy sauce. Soy sauce is based on making 
this particular, you know, growing this particular microbe, this mold, on, you know, some toasted cracked wheat and some cooked soybeans, and allows it to grow this mold such that you can create this awesome ferment that's, that ends up being soy sauce. Which, and and, let's really quick kind of put people in a mind frame, like, imagine putting some edamame and some toasted flour in your mouth and just kind of chewing it, and it does not taste like soy sauce. So like you start there and you think of that, you know, and then we have this amazing transformation, right? Yeah, the, the transformation is spectacular. I don't, it's, it's pretty indescri indescribable, but the driver behind it is the fact that these, this particular mold uh, creates, uh, called Aspergillus oryzae, um, which is the main uh, species that is used um, for this application, it creates enzymes. And these enzymes allow you to, primarily two, two functionalities. You get to break proteins down into amino acids, which are very delicious to us. They create that level of umami that makes us crave the food. But it's also one of those things that is, is um, wired into us uh, as humans in terms of trying to get, um, like detect where nutrition is available to us. And the, the con key constituents of proteins as amino acids tell us that the food is very nutritious. Uh, so basically, we're talking about these enzymes in terms of protease enzymes, which break the proteins down into amino acids, which create umami, which we really know and love. And the other side of the coin is that when you grow koji, you also create um, amylase enzymes, which break, which break uh, complex carbohydrates into simple sugars. And that creates uh, another, su another substance that is nutritionally available to us. And one of the things we like to point out a lot is that we are already every day utilizing enzymes to create, take starches and break them down into sugars. And it's, it's the enzymes that are in your saliva that every day when you're chewing some food and you are chewing some starches, you automatically are creating, you know, more nutritionally available food such that you can digest it. And, and, and the, people can easily do this at home. If you take a saltine cracker, you know, just a plain cracker um, and chew it up, you can even do this with a pretzel kind of hold it in your mouth for about two, three minutes. It's pretty hard to get to that two or three minutes, but you will, you will actually, that mashup in your mouth, you will start to taste simple sugars. So, um, you know, this happens on a regular basis and you can do these quick experiments, you know, uh, to actually see the proof in the pudding that these enzymes do work. They do transform foods. Um, you know, Rich has touched on, you know, this bioavailability, these indicators of nutrient density. Um, and how Koji works in this manner is incredibly important because if we think back far enough to people using these ingredients, uh, using Koji to create these foods, it really allowed people to get the proper nutrition that they needed to at a time when it was relatively hard to, days before refrigeration. I mean, days before we even had controlled fire and heating sources, um, you know, we're going back thousands of years at this point. So be able to, to, to be able to take this mold and allow its enzymes to do the hard work that our body normally would do through the course of digestion ahead of time and allow those foods to be even more easily fermented or nutrient dense was an absolutely wonderful, wonderful revolution in food making. I mean, if we look at this as a technology, this is probably one of the most ancient and important technologies that any of our civilizations throughout the course of documented history have ever been able to work with. It's allowed us to do so many things from being able to kind of relax a little bit and pursue studying medicine and art and music um, and those sorts of things, because we didn't have to put as much energy into securing the nutrients that we needed to do. We could allow an organism to essentially do it for us. Yeah, and I think one of the, one of the other keys is that, you know, as, as Jeremy has spoken about in terms of, you know, the technology of refrigeration and freezing, um, that was not available back in the day in terms of being able to preserve food. And if you can think about when, when all of the food was available at once during harvest, there was no way that you were going to be able to preserve it in such a way without uh, a level of being able to leverage microbes to be able to preserve them <laughs> and utilize them in such a way that you can hold them for a long period of time. And the key to Koji 
um, and, and, you know, molds of this like is that it creates these capacities to break down these um, more complex substances into simpler substances such that it can go through this microbial wave of, of change such that it will continue to be preserved and continue to be more bioavailable and even more delicious over time. And I think that's the key behind um, the ideas of fermentation in terms of creating acidity, alcohol, um, as, as well as, you know, levels of salt and dehydration that you're able to hold these foods for a long period of time. But over those periods of time, it makes the, the um, particular fermentation, especially when they're koji based, more complex and more delicious and more bioavailable. And then such that you can just basically take a spoonful of it and put it in with a little bit of your rice or, or whatever your staple was that you had, you know, just enough of to, to sustain every day. And even just with a little bit of water, you that's how typically miso soup was made went very simply. And it could be that it was this nu nutritive broth in the same way that you would have a, a stock with, um, with bones. Well, and let's think about complete proteins for a second. Uh, a spoonful, spoonful of goju jang or jang or some duchi or some miso on some rice, we're literally looking at a complete set of amino acids. Um, that the body can can utilize and easily get and not have to break down or synthesize themselves. Like it's really, really fantastic. Um, you know, Rich and I talk about this a lot and uh, as evidence of us writing a book about it. And one of the things that we like to strive to do is really show people how easy working with these things are. Um, we want you to understand that people with far less understanding of the science behind this and access to technologies that we have these days have been making foods, they've been A, growing koji, they domesticated it, they grew it, they've sustained it for how many generations over the past roughly 10,000 years. Um, and they've been able to do that, like I said, with far less understanding of technology, of science, and access to resources that we have. You know, one thing I kind of like to, to delve into, which always cracks Rich up a little bit, is I'm a firm believer that Koji, that some of these organisms are, are more or less sentient in their behavior. Um, you know, when we look at an organism finding its ecological niche and it being able to sustain, survive, reproduce, and thrive um, based on another organism providing it and meeting all of its needs, it's pretty fascinating. And from our standpoint, it kind of begs the question, like, did Koji choose, whether it happened through a random uh, genetic mutation or not, but did Koji make some sort of sentient conscious decision to evolve the way it did, knowing that we would find it delicious and that it would provide us nutrients in a way that we would keep it going, um, you know? There's, uh, there's a lot to think about when you start to get into the realm of how these things work, why they work, and, and just overall fascination with them. And this is one of the things that drew both of us in originally, you know, examining these questions, looking at these molds, seeing how they work, and also like coming to the realization that there are many, many cultures throughout Asia and Southeast Asia going as far west I'm just trying to think direction wise, um, going as far west as India, as far east as, you know, islands off of Japan, um, down throughout the, the Malay Peninsula. This is a really wide swath of land with many, many people in it. And if we look at the density of the people in these parts of the world, far more people in the world rely on koji or kojis, I should say, if we encompass all these different species that are used in these ways, uh, then people that don't. So, you know, little food for thought tonight as you're falling asleep. <laughs> did Koji will itself into your life? Think about that. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that we like to talk about in terms of our investigations when we first got into Koji was that, you know, we, we had already been getting into a bunch of condiments through throughout you know asia in terms of understanding i mean um we are we are ones who will just go into a market and just fully investigate exactly what it is that's there and and be adventurous and just try things so 
we, we don't want you to be limited by um, like thinking that you have to absolutely start making your own Koji or going crazy and, and, and buying Koji specific things at first, like first start just going to your local Asian market or, or even your, your large grocery store. I mean, it has things like, you know, I, I just picked this up this morning because I ran out. Um, it's just like some goji jang. Like this is a great all purpose, um, what we like to call, you know, sort of, you know, if you want to um, categorize uh, a paste like this, like a miso or goji jang or doban jang, it's very similar to the usage of a pesto. If you're just, you know, basically you want to, you know, grill something off or like put something, like have some seasoning and some vegetables, like this is this is a great paste just to throw in as your seasoning salt, and it creates a wonderful sauce with just the inherent, um, the inherent like liquids that come off of what you're cooking for deglazing. And, and Rich, to to kind of expound on that even a little bit more, uh, ones that may be a little bit mu more mild, you know, that are straight beans or rice or that sort of thing that don't have like chilies and garlic in them, you know, in terms of the baking world. Uh, roughly anything that doesn't rely on heavy gluten development. So any type of pastry or cookie or that sort of thing, really you can take these pastes and swap them out for the salt in your recipe. And that was something that Rich really explored early on and uh, just making different cookie dough and brownie recipes. And instead of using the salt called for in the recipe, he was using equal parts of assorted amino paste. Yeah, and if you think about um, having a, a complex sugar, like creating a, you know, caramelization and, and cooking it and being assured that you don't burn yourself uh, throughout the process, it's very easy just to add, you know, a little bit of, you know, basically just take any syrup that you have and add a little bit of miso or gojujang or, or dobanjang and you, you have this caramely uh, delicious sauce that like I'll kind of, I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so the other thing that we've been talking about is the fact that, you know, koji creates sugars and that, that powers, um, of, that powers the rest of fermentation. So we can talk about, you know, things like alcohol. A friend of mine made this um, rice wine. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that sake is based on. But we, we start with amazake, which is just basically taking a little bit of koji, some cooked grains, and some water. And we let them sit around for on the order of like a week or two. And we create this really great um, sweet porridge. And, and that's one of the things that Koji can do is I have this sweet porridge that I made with Koji. Uh, but because, you know, a lot of folks talk about how, how Koji has citrus notes. Um, I made this um, grapefruit amazake. So I used grapefruit juice instead of water for, for my medium. So you can quickly create something that's, sweet and delicious, and then let it go through the process of creating an alcohol. And then ultimately, you know, you get this product that everybody knows and loves, rice wine vinegar. You, you, have, you probably already have this in your pantry, but that's the result of koji as well. So we combine these things like in terms of making a teriyaki sauce with soy sauce and, and rice wine vinegar and some sugar. And you already have something that's fully kojified that you had no idea was these constituents. And the other, the other side of the coin is that when you make um, a koji-based alcohol with all these grains, you come out with a particular uh, slurry, some um, sake kazu, and you can actually make pickles with the, the, um, with the leavings, the solids. So this is uh, some suncho kazuzuke that my, my friends over at Culture Pickle Shop make, and it's, it's one of the most amazing pickles. So you can actually take products of koji um, that are byproducts or even the product itself you know like just take some miso and just rub it around some vegetables and let them sit and you can have this delicious pickle over time you know rich the, the utilization of koji over uh broad swath of ingredients like it's it's really mind-blowing how that can happen right you, you can make all these different foods and then and inherently, most of these different foods that you make have some sort of byproduct, but that can be then funneled into another koji make. Um, you know, here at Larder, uh, we often, uh, late summer, early fall, get these humongous. And when I say humongous, we had a 13-pound sweet potato, Amish grown, uh, <laughs> that we got from one of our local farmers. And whenever I get those in, um, I do like an Okinawan-style alcohol. So... I cook off the potatoes, I boil them, um, or I steam them. I inoculate them with black koji, 
uh, Aspergillus luciensis, uh, the, the Awamore variant. Uh, and then we turn that into an Amazaki. Let that, we'll pitch it with yeast. Uh, typically with sweet potatoes, we like uh, a, a strain of bread, uh, just because the earthy, funky, farmhousey notes that sweet potatoes have, it goes really good with that. Um, our ultimate goal here is making a black vinegar, um, you know, out of these sweet potatoes. But our favorite product we get out of the whole process is by the time it's become vinegar, we'll leave those leaves you mentioned um, in the barrel the whole time. And so we've got, um, you know, it's mainly broken down at this point, but we've got a fair amount of, of solids and muck in the bottom of this barrel. And we'll take it and we pitch it with a little bit of pumpkin pie spice. And, you know, originally we thought it would be like a ketchup, but it eats like an applesauce and it's fantastic. <laughs> Um, I mean, all this past week, we had some, some hanging around that we've been using up and we were smearing it all over a vegan sandwich uh, that we were making uh, with a little mustard in it. And it just ate fantastic. And it just goes to show that from one make to another to another, there's always something you can be left with, especially when you're, you're using Koji and taking advantage of its enzymes uh, that leads you into something else that can be absolutely fantastic and spectacular. Yeah, and I, I think that the, there's this chain of ultimately every everything that you've made um, be, becomes something that's delicious. And I think I think one of the important things that, that I learned throughout this process of understanding all that Koji can do is that there's this level of interconnectivity of all these makes that we talk about in the book that really highlights um, the the possibilities through enzymatic um, action as well as, you know, the- If the I can steal the screen for a second. <laughs> so those of you that can see me, so, you know, here's some of these charts that are in the book. Uh, those of you that have copies or are waiting on copies are pages 40 and 41. Um, you know, but we worked really hard to create these maps so you, we could visualize what Rich is talking about right now. I'll let you finish, Rich. Yeah, and it's just, I think one of those things that we often, we often talk about in terms of fermentation and preservation in general, is that when we talk about a beer, or we talk about a vinegar, or we talk about a yogurt, um, or we talk about, say, a kraut, like all of these things are talked about in a very specific way in a very specific context. Whereas, when you think about the interconnected interconnectivity of you know the whole fermentation natural fermentation process is that we're just picking out a little sliver of time in terms of how the these ingredients coexist to create something delicious and that's the result of you know this this idea of locale and what people had for technology what people had for ingredients and they were able to pick out something that's really wonderful that is celebrated in a very specific way that people study their whole lives to make the absolute best soy sauce or the best cheese or whatever it is that you want. But these discoveries were made just because people were trying to get to the point of understanding of how could we build a preserve that would last us this season such that we could, we, until we could grow food again. And the key to that was finding a very specific circumstance such that they would not get sick and it was super delicious and nutritionally available. And that was, that's an amazing thing. That's how the cornerstone of all these wonderful preserves that we have today. What we, we are looking to have you understand more about is how Koji and fermentation allows you to open up that bandwidth to whatever you have accessible, whatever you love and whatever ingredients are available to you and just start playing around with these concepts. Which, so which Rich, on, on that note, like the things that you are making in your kitchen right now are so unique to you from a terroir standpoint, from, uh, you know, your own microbiome and what you bring to the fermentation game, uh, you know, to, to the area that you're working in, um, actually physically working in, not just the terroir of the ingredients, that what you are making at this moment is unique the world over. Nobody else is making that. Um, and that's what's fantastic is your makes using Koji become so individualized and so personalized that it's just fantastic. So you as a craftsperson exploring the use of this and being able to make these foods, you can instill intense amounts of pride. And it just goes to show that the people that were doing this early on 
and the different cultures that have codified and put very specific names on very specific products made specific ways in specific locales with specific ingredients, you can see why that happened, why these makes evolved in, in these specific ways. Um, so it's really interesting how intimate Koji allows us to be with the foods that we're making and what we're doing. Yeah, and, and the power of Koji is that what I learned early on was, you know, using sort of, I guess, like this methodology top level, like engineering brain I have is to understand that. It's very you could, top level. That you could just take any protein and use that as, as, your, as your like engine for creating amino acids or you could use any starch and grow koji on it. You just had to condition, like for growing koji, you just had to condition it in the same way that the starch is gelatinized and readily available for the koji to, to grow on. And, you know, with proteins, you know, as Jeremy has experimented a lot with charcuterie and aging meats, it's just loading them all of these in protease enzymes really accelerates the process where for, in a, typical process, you're waiting for microbes that are creating much less enzymes over a period of time to create these wonderful flavors to, to break the, the, the core, um, you know, the core food products down that you can just totally mind blowing in terms of how it can make things more accessible in a way that they become more nutritionally available for us and, and more delicious. And it's just um, so like, I guess, humbling to be able to understand that as, as Jeremy was saying before, you're imagining chewing on some, you know, edamame and some toasted wheat and throwing some salt in your mouth. You're never going to create the flavor of a soy sauce or a miso over a period of a year. That are in your mouth. Yeah. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and all you have to do is, is cook them and toast them and, and blend them and sit, hold them in a jar and just wait. That's all you have to do to create this delicious product. You don't have to fight anything. You just have to make sure it's, it's held in a very specific way, which is very simple, just due to the fact that it had to be simple back when well, this all started. And Rich, you touch on a beautiful thing here, right? So um, I was definitely a kid growing up that if there was a way to get my homework done more quickly um, or pass a test with a better grade, like I would explore whatever option I could <laughs> that didn't involve actually doing hard work. Um, <laughs> So the, you know, the, the joy of fermenting with Koji and creating foods with Koji is you do very little work. Your job is to act as a shepherd of sorts or a farmer, right? You want to keep the, the fields weed free and keep predators away from the flock. Um, but if you make sure that there's, you know, access to the proper amount of light or air and water, uh, it's going to take off and it's going to do all the work for you. You know, from start to finish, an amino sauce may take a year to make, right? It may take a year to make soy sauce, but the active amount of work that you are actually going to do during the course of that time probably is less than two hours of work over a year. I mean, it's really, really a small amount. Uh, and, you know, things like uh, different amino paste and alcohols and vinegar, it's all the same way. So you have actually very, very little hands-on time that you're putting into this. The rest is just waiting for your spoils. Um, so Koji is actually a great, uh, outside of having children, it's probably the best lesson in patience you can go through. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know, it's just, and, and one of those things that we, we all, you know, we all do is, you know, you splash that little bit of, you know, marinade, whether it be, you know, something that's prepared ahead of time, you know, we all buy a bottle of barbecue sauce, right? Or we buy some hot sauce or we buy some soy sauce and we tweak it to what we like. But when you understand that you can create this core product on your own with whatever ethics, whatever ingredients that you want and you hold dear, hold dear and you enjoy, you can just, you just do it and then you just wait until it's done. I mean, literally, you don't even have to know how to cook really to create these sauces. Like you, you know that, you know, you can just, you grab a bottle of ketchup, right? The same, in the same sense of grabbing, you know, a, a little, you know, a little jar of miso, a little jar of gochujang, 
or some soy sauce that you made, it's in that same exact context. And because all the work is done for you, that you've done your, that ultimately you've done yourself with very little work, it's a pretty satisfying piece. And then what the beauty of it is once you start into this sort of fermentation community and sharing is that once you make something and a lot of something, it's very easy to share it and then be able to start to taste what other people are doing and understand what they're doing and then tweak your process and understand more about it and like move in a direction that, that suits you and makes you feel like, hey, I really love this product and I enjoy it and I just want to make another one that's, that's similar but different because we all suffer from, we, we suffer from this level of familiarity with things that we always want it to taste the same. And I don't think Jeremy and I really suffer from that. We kind of suffer from, oh, what can we do with this to make it taste like really great and in a different way, but you know, still have that core understanding of how functionally you do it. And I think that's the beauty of really celebrating your locale, your farmers, your restaurants, is that you begin to understand more about how to get these cool products and what it takes to make it. And and it becomes more beautiful because it's like then then it becomes like hey let's let's really celebrate like local environments and and not have to de demand things from overseas or or like from like all the way across the country it, it's it's pretty powerful tool to be able to start working with fermentation even if it's in the smallest way of making a little bit of you know sauerkraut well you know especially with a lot of the koji makes right because as foods and as a Jewish boy from the North Coast growing up, you know, I never once thought, I didn't even really make a connection to soybeans and soy sauce. Like, you know, as I got older and as I became a chef and went to culinary school and that sort of thing, you know, every once in a while I'd think, well, wait, how, how do soybeans become soy sauce? You know, these process, processes are fairly mysterious if you don't understand them, if you don't know what they are. And, Interestingly and slightly unfortunately, um, in a lot of parts of the world where these foods come from, these are no longer the, the, the foods are no longer the province of the house. Um, they are concentrated with a handful of nowadays industrial producers. Um, even in Japan, where we get this word koji from, people don't really make koji at home anymore. You can go to the store and you can buy koji in various forms. But that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, Rich and I were just discussing with someone a couple days ago, you know, up until the 50s, um, a lot of traditional families in Japan, uh, the, the wife or the women in the house would make miso, um, you know, a yearly batch of miso. That's not done anymore. You know, so it's not just here in America and Europe where we're kind of removed from these traditional food ways. Um, even in the homes of Koji, uh, a lot of people are removed from what these foods are, how they're made, you know, how they come to be, and even why they came to be. Um, so it's fantastic now that we have some technologies to add to our Koji makes, such as this Zoom and the internet. And, you know, everybody has access to a word processing document. So you can log what you are making how you're making it. We can preserve this knowledge and we can spread it amongst each other, which is absolutely fantastic. Dude, so um, I think it's demo time because we've been eating up a lot of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you want to uh, show people how to make some miso? Yeah, so um, I originally intended this to be like super simple, straightforward, anybody can make miso at home, but my little pack of uh, dried koji rice from um, a giant online retailer did not make it here as, as promised. It was supposed to be two day shipping, but it didn't happen. Um, so let me just grab a couple quick things. So I have some of my own koji. Thank, thank gosh I grow a lot of it. But I, I wanted to show you, and I'll, I'm gonna move the camera around a little bit as I do this. Um, it's as simple as you see, I've got some, some beans here. These are black eyed peas. Uh, it doesn't even have to be soybeans. Uh, now different beans have different protein contents in them. So a bean with a higher protein content in the end is gonna be more delicious. But when we're using a bean that has a lower protein content than uh, say soy, 
Um, then we like to optimize and choose a koji that fits it appropriately. So we can either grow the koji on the beans, we can use a pre-made dried koji, which is super easy, or we can grow it on a higher protein starch, such as barley. Um, but in this case, it's literally as simple as open your can of beans, dump it into a bowl. If you have a scale, it's a good idea to use it. But for something like this and for ease and to show you that it really can't be messed up, take some koji. This is some beautiful barley koji right here. And crumble it up, mix it in with your beans. And you can do this all by hand or if you've got a KitchenAid meat grinder, just dumping this right through there or into your food processor on the pulse setting is really easy. One thing you definitely want to do and we always recommend is to weigh the salt. So you find out the combined weight of your koji and your beans and you figure out a percentage of that weight. Uh, the, typically speaking, the more salt, the longer you need to age this. So if I want to use this in about, let's say, a month to three months, I'm going to keep a lower salt application. And, and in that range, I do 5 to 7% salt. Uh, sometimes I like it a little saltier. Sometimes I like it a little less salty. So I figure out my salt. I've got my weight. Sprinkle it on. There we go. Do I look like Salt Bay? No. He's more handsome. <laughs> He's definitely more handsome. I know more about Koji, though, than Salt Bay does. <laughs> we'll get him on the Koji train. Um, and then, you know, mix. Mix by hand. And you can see I'm getting in here. I'm squeezing. Because the goal is when we pack this into a jar to age it, we really don't want any air pockets in there. And if need be, you know, canned beans are pretty moist. So using canned beans, I've never had to add access liquid uh, to do this. But you mash and mash good, and you mash until you have this nice paste that when you pack it in a jar will fit nicely. Um, when you cover your jar up, which you need to do, you should try to weigh it down some way. And you also do need a little bit of air exposure going on here, just some off gassing and a little oxygen exchange. Uh, it helps. But literally you take this mix and not even all your beans have to be mashed up. It's cool to have some chunky in there, right? Like some people like smooth peanut butter, other people like chunky, some people like both. Find your happy medium for what you like. Pack it away and let it sit. Where do you keep this? You keep this in a place where you are comfortable, right? These fungi, these organisms are very similar to us in terms of the temperature ranges and humidities they like. So keep it somewhere like in your kitchen where you can see it. You can see it bubbling around if it bubbles. You can see if you maybe need to weigh it down a little more or give it a little more air exposure. But it's super simple. It's super straightforward. And even this mixture right here itself, if I let this sit for a couple hours, is super flavorful. You could totally add a little bit of this instead of some salt into like a seasonal bean or pea salad. You could pack this itself onto a steak before you grill it to add some flavor. So you really don't need much time at all. The koji itself is already delicious. So I'm going to go rinse my hand really quick. <laughs> well, while Jeremy's rinsing, rinsing off, um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about, um, you know, just, just, how to util utilize miso in a different way other than just um, creating uh, miso soup or using it in a somewhat savory way. Um, one of the things that I like to do is I just like to take a little bit of miso and add it to just some granulated sugar. So right here, um, uh, I actually have a, 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 like the leavings of a jar of uh, my friend Mike Betts. He made this maitake um, guento miso for me and it was pretty delicious. Um, so there's probably only about a teaspoon left in there. So what I do a lot of the time is when I have this, these leftovers is what you can do is you can just add, a, you know, just basically I got some sugar here and I just put the sugar in the jar and, uh, let me grab it. and then I just mix it up. And now what I'm doing is I'm just actively, you know, how people like caramel, salty caramel sugar. I'm basically making 
a miso salty sugar. Rich, you should use your fingers so you can lick them afterwards. <laughs> it's so delicious. <laughs> uh, so then, you know, you just kind of mash up. And this is this you can use in, um, in the same way they use brown sugar. Um, or, you know, you can just add it to, to macerate some, some fruit that you have. So um, I actually um, had some strawberries that I bought because my daughter loves strawberries. And a couple hours ago, I just um, sprinkled some of the sugar on there. And, and now I have these awesome, like, you know, miso noted, more like a caramely type um, fruit that you can just take and put on all sorts of things like ice cream. You can serve it as is. Um, you can use it for, you know, some sort of, you know, I guess you can just use it as like for a turnover. Um, and then what's really great is that you get this liquid that you can just um, kind of, you can strain off and then you can use that to just to make a simple soda or, you know, some sort of cocktail that you want to make. So there's this versatility of adding complexity with things that you already have in terms of just investigating these these awesome, you know, umami bomb, you know, condiments that you can just pick up and just use right away in a different way if you think about it in more of a sweet sense than a savory sense. But that doesn't mean that you can't just take a little, a little bit of goju jang and, you know, some peanut butter and put them together and make the most awesome PB&J with those strawberries. So you could kind of yeah. like just mix and match all of these sorts of flavors. And that's the key to like why we love tomatoes so much is they have that hint of umami. And when you make a tomato jam, it just like has that little bit of like, I really want to eat more of this and I don't know why. And it's because of the umami. So if you just, you know, hack, you know, any sort of preserve that you're making with a little bit of umami, it'll change everything. And everybody will ask you for the recipe and you can just tell them, I just added some miso. <laughs> And then they'll be like, what's that? And then you can kind of go into this whole diatribe that we have been going through. So have <laughs> fun with mind that. too is um, your, if you're growing koji, your fresh koji is completely edible by itself, uh, especially if you're growing uh, one of the citric acid producing species. And um, it's really like, it tastes like sour past kids. It's really incredible. It's like you making a sour face because my, my tongue is puckering. <laughs> And then, you know, in talking about that miso peanut butter that I made, and you have this jar, like, and then the other thing is you've got this other ferment. You have, like, this jar of pickles that has all of this liquid, right? So we, we all love, like, cold, like, cold sesame noodles. If you take some of, this, some of this pickling liquid with some miso and some peanut butter and you just whip it up, you have the most, like, the greatest, like, sort of Thai peanut sauce that you can make with just stuff that's in your refrigerator and a little bit of miso. It's just use your ideas in terms of your fundamental understanding to extend into everything else. And that's, that's what we do. That's what's in the book in terms of all the folks, especially um, the people from all over the world that we've had join us in experimenting and sharing their ideas. So um, I think we, we've got a few questions coming in and we okay. have two right away about curing meat with koji uh, and accelerated dry aging of koji. So um, tips for curing meat with koji, if you're making charcuterie, follow your curing recipe. Um, if you want to add an amazaki to your cure or if you're brining your meat, uh, go ahead and do that. You can use that as a liquid instead of water. Um, in terms of like age accelerating the, the dry aging of meat, um, uh, the question is, do you apply rice koji or actual koji kin? And you can do both. I believe the most tasty results are when we actually use the koji kin. So we're using the spores of koji mixed with a starch. Uh, corn starch works really, really well because it's got lots of amylose in it. Um, gently coat a piece of meat with that, like shake the excess off. And then we hold that at roughly 90 degrees Fahrenheit and high humidity. Uh, most of the time, you know, with your koji, uh, if you're growing on a starch, you're looking at a solid 48 hours. When we grow on meat, because the starch layer is so thin, we notice it's fully bloomed around like between the 30 and 36 hour mark. Uh, right away, we get the meat cold and then we cook at the proper safe temperatures uh, based on, you know, where 
what you're cooking and, and where you are. So I hope that answered those two questions. Rick, someone wants to know if it's easy to grow koji itself at home. Yeah, I mean, koji is really easy to grow at home. Um, the, the key thing to, to understand is that you have to set it up for very specific conditions to create a humid environment and keeping it slightly warm. So it's analogous to having, you know, when you're proofing bread, such that you have, you know, a level of humidity and heat to, to get the microbes to, to take hold and grow. Um, we have, you know, we have a bunch of different methods in the book in terms of how to create these environments. But one of the things that we talk about is the fact that once you have, have your grain cooked and you can, you know, basically put it in a, you know, um, a food safe tray um, to be able to hold it like in about and then have it be about an, an inch and a half high uh, when you have inoculated it. All you have to do is actually put some plastic wrap over it and put it in a place where it's somewhere between 70 to 90 degrees. And one of the hacks that, that a lot of people do is they'll put it on the, on the top of the refrigerator because the heat that's, that's coming off of your, your condenser on the back will create enough heat such that it'll create that particular temperature. And we Rich, do have- just, Let me just jump in really quick here. I'm not sure if people saw this. Uh, so just like Rich was talking, sorry the light is blinding this out because the code is white, but uh, <laughs> food safe container. The grain, which barley in this case, was filled just about an inch um, deep. And the whole thing was had been wrapped in plastic wrap. And then it creates the proper humidity without you having to do anything. And Rich, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, and then um, what for that particular method, you just poke a, a few holes in the top just to allow enough uh, circulation so there's air for the koji. A lot of instances, I, I, I don't necessarily poke holes in it. It's, it's enough that um, if you're coming in to mix every 12 hours, you can get that aeration and enough air. But for Jeremy's specific method, he parks a little bit more holes and um, he just lets it sit and doesn't even mix it in terms of um, exhausting the heat that it's created by the koji as it grows. I mean, look at how thick and dense this mat is. Like this has not been mixed. This has not been stirred. We just set it and forget it. Um, so Rich, a uh, uh, question here. Uh, well, if you use canned beans for miso, do you drain off the liquid? Um, yes, you do. Um, the good thing is, whether you're using canned beans or you're cooking your own, whatever it is, um, if you have too much liquid, that's okay. Um, if you have too little liquid, that's when you can run into some issues. Uh, so it's always okay to have a little extra. And in the amino paste making process or in the miso making process, the liquid that comes off of miso is called tamari and it's used just like soy sauce. Um, it's much more prized and it's much more delicious than traditional shoyus are. Um, and you don't get a lot. So, you know, it's, it's super special. Interestingly enough, the only difference between a soy sauce and an amino paste, right? An, an amino sauce and an amino paste is the amount of liquid in there. So if you add too much liquid to your amino paste, uh, maybe you want to add a little more and just put it through the soy sauce steps as opposed to the miso steps. Yeah, and, and in terms of if there isn't enough liquid, the one way that um, miso makers can tell is uh, through the traditional technique of creating these balls with your hands that you would uh, basically throw into the, 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 uh, ferm the fermentation crock. Um, what you can do is you can make this ball and then if you uh, press it in between your hands and you see that the ball like cracks as you're pressing it together, there's a little, there isn't enough moisture to be able to create the proper amount of fermentation um, to, to keep it moving in, in the direction that you want in the period of time. Uh, so Rich, uh, Siri, how are we doing on time? We got a couple more minutes. Yeah, we we started a little bit late, so we have about five more minutes. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, so Rich here, um, it says uh, uh, when it says in your book Koji Starter in quotes for the popcorn recipe in your book, does that mean the base spores or the spore flour mixture? Um, uh, yeah, so spore flour mixture. Yeah, right. anytime so. we re we refer to Koji starter throughout the book, like we mean dispersed spores. Neither of us ever works with straight spores. Um, both, it's hard to measure them. They float away and become, you know, you don't want to breathe them in, get them in your lungs, that sort of thing. So 
Disbursement allows you to manage them more efficiently, it's more cost effective, and it's safer. So, um, Panina is asking, uh, potentially seeking a kosher source of spores. So, um, knowing what we know about the koji growing process, I can't see anything about it being unkosher. Seeing though that the industry is concentrated in Japan and parts of China, um, I don't know if there's any certification that was going to get stamped on that. So that's one thing to keep, up, keep in mind. Inherently, the raising of it, the growing of it, the places that it's produced, uh, especially in Japan, these are produced in sterilized laboratories. Uh, long, long gone are the days of like growing it in, in a koji house, like a cedar lined room and that sort of thing for spore. Uh, nowadays it's highly controlled. Uh, all the, the batches are tested to prevent random mutations and quality issues and that sort of thing. Uh, so in terms of it becoming unclean, uh, in terms of kashrut or halal or any of that, um, aside from like a, a pig, or a lobster getting loose and running through the laboratory, which would never happen because they only let the scientists in there anyways. Um, I can't see that happening. So uh, you have to ask yourself what level of kashrut you're, you're comfortable with um, because I don't know if they certify in Japan or China. Um, uh, Rick, someone's asking, can you sous vide bags of incubated rice in a water bath instead of the koji tray method? Um, we don't recommend that. You want a higher heat cook on your, your substrate. So whether you're using barley or rice or beans, uh, you want to be able to get to temperatures that are more or less going to sterilize the substrate. Um, you know, if you, sure, you could sous vide uh, at 200 degrees, 212 degrees, uh, and pasteurize your substrate, but you're gonna get a lot of steam in that bag also, and you may not get even temperature distribution. Uh, so, you know, cook your rice, either the methods we outline in the book, or a rice cooker, or any way that you're comfortable cooking it. Um, boil it if you want, you know, that's, that's totally cool. Uh, all right, Rich, I'll let you take this one. Is one time of year better than another for using koji? In Japan, winter is the time for making miso and sake. Any advice for hot times? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we, you know, that I've, I've, also, I've always um, found to be interesting is that the way that you tell the number of years that uh, a miso, it, how, old a, how many years a miso is, is how many summers it's gone through. So the key the key to making miso back in the day for preservation made all the sense in the world because you had this huge stockpile of ingredients that you had to preserve. And what you did was you salted these ingredients such that once the winter hit, it would crash any sort of microbial behavior with the salt and creating such a, like, a low active environment for the microbes that anything that you didn't want wouldn't, wouldn't survive through the winter time. And then once it, the it, spring it, hit. This, this allowed more enzymatic action to happen compared to the bacterial action that's happening with like these acid producing um, uh, bacteria that allow us to ferment foods. Yeah, and, and, and what it would allow is once you reach that point of, you know, this, you're seeing this level of enzymatic behavior and, you know, basically only retaining the microbes that you needed to continue through, is that once it hit the heat of, of the summer, it would really start to be, do its conversion process and be, start to become super flavorful and start you know, letting these microbes do what they needed to do. But in, in all senses, in terms of the way that, you, that we make um, these particular you know, ferments today is that it doesn't really matter when, when you start them. It's a matter of like, if you are putting things in, in these like, and you want them to be super active due to the, ambient temperature of your environment that's the advantage that you get out of if if you are starting you know at the beginning at the end of winter or the beginning of the you know springtime but other than that you can make these ferments anytime you want and you can find environments in your house like by your furnace or like we're talking about on top of your refrigerator to create these conditions such that things may finish faster than than you would normally in in, nor in other conditions where you know they would be fully affected by the freeze of the winter and things of that nature. 
Um, so Rich, I think uh, maybe time for two more questions. One's a quick answer and I'll take it. Oh, yeah. And uh, another's a little bit more complex. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, I think what we'll do, A, thank you everybody. And yeah, the questions sure. that we didn't get to tonight, as I said, like reach out to us, various social media platforms. Rich is at our cook quest um, on Instagram. I am at TM Gastronaut. Um, you know, you can uh, get a hold of us uh, fairly easily. Um, you know, so that's that's a way we can we can get back to you too. And there's many many awesome forums, you know, on different social media sites too, uh, where there's a lot of knowledgeable people who are working with Koji in various ways. Uh, so post in those groups too. What's fantastic about them is no question's a stupid question. Everybody's got to start somewhere. <laughs> So like, don't feel like, oh, if I post yeah. this question, are they going to call me like a newbie idiot? No. Like people are going to guide you and say, hey, when I did this, I did this and, and that and try it and might work for you. So uh, really quick here. Uh, someone says, I can only imagine bacon amino paste is delicious beyond description. Yes, it is. Where can I learn to make it? Uh, in our book, you can use the base miso recipe. And instead of using beans, uh, use bacon. There you go. Uh, yeah. yeah. Cook it off, um, you know, so that it's, uh, you don't want it to be like crispy, uh, but just get a light cook on it, like cook it halfway and uh, go ahead and use a base miso recipe. And then Rich, the last question here, um, it says, you mentioned cultural appropriation no and, the language, <laughs> and the language we use around Koji in Koji Alchemy. Um, they say, I like the terms amino paste and liquid aminos. Uh, that we use. Could you expound on the cultural implications? Are there any? It seems quite universal in terms of these foods all over Asia. So what does culture mean in that context? I think for us, like, you know, for our applications and how we try to explain uh, this utilization, it's, it's, it's an umbrella of all of these specific cultures doing their specific things. And we like to see it in the sense of these, um, you know, the, this leveraging of enzymes with, you know, the, with Koji. And then also these fermentation processes that are, um, in, are, are that come in tied in conjunction with them that have really no cultural appropriation at all. I mean, if you talk, if we talk about just in general, lacto fermentation, that's across cultures, that's how we refer, that's how we refer to as like the kind of umbrella case of all of these cultures doing their own specific things. We like to celebrate each culture in terms of what they make specifically in terms of understanding more about what they are and how they're made. And, and I think that's the way that we kind of separate out any sort of cultural appropriation. It's just a methodology of how to utilize these ingredients with the, with the specific mold and not saying that it's one thing or, or the other it's to allow each culture to celebrate their specific make. And we have tried to have as much of an understanding of exactly how to do that, such that we can kind of branch it into these other things that we're doing and understand why, you know, why dochi is done in a specific way, which is kind of more like a whole bean miso than, you know, a soy sauce and how they individually are created in different ways, but ultimately come to the same starting point of, of the methodology. Awesome. Should we turn it over to Sari? Thanks, Sari. Thanks, um, first, I just want to thank Jeremy and Rich. Thank you so, so much. That was so incredibly informative. You guys are such Koji rock stars. It's just amazing <laughs> to like see you do your thing sort of in the flesh, in the flesh. Um, and just thank everyone else. Like, wow, what an incredible community. We had people here tonight from Australia, Japan, India. I'm so moved. Um, and just to say, you know, again, um, I think it's just so important to like create community right now, just be kind to each other. So this was really um, a very like heartwarming and meaningful thing to come together for this conversation. And I really, really hope that you'll come back for more. Like I said, we do these programs with Gastro Obscura every Sunday night. We have other programs that are ongoing throughout the week. Um, so I hope that you will join us for more and more. Um, and to sure. echo again, Jeremy, Rich, follow them both. They are so open, um, so engaged. And I don't think there's any questions that couldn't be answered by getting their book. All of, it is such an amazing resource. Um, we've partnered with Greenlight Bookstore 
in Brooklyn. So I'll, I'll send an email tomorrow just reminding you um, where you can get their book. And it's also just a great way to support an independent bookstore right now. Um, so again, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to send a lot of love out there in the world. Please be good to each other. We are recording, but we're not sending this out since this, since this was a ticketed event. So I'm really glad that you all had the opportunity um, to be with us tonight. And please stay safe and be good to each other. So good night. Hope to see you soon. Thank Bye, you. Hi, Rich. Thank you so much. Be well. Thank you, everybody.